session. Well, let's stand and begin our service with prayer. Father, we come into your presence tonight and we rejoice and glorify you and praise you for your presence among us today. Thank you for the blessings and for the joy that we feel in our heart. We're praying you'll come and fill this service with your divine presence, touch people's hearts again. But Lord, I pray also for those two officers whose lives are still hanging in the balance out there in California. We're just viciously and cruelly shot. Father, can you intercede for those two deputy sheriffs and protect them and speed their healing, we ask. Lord, help our focus in this service to be upon you and upon your son, Jesus' love, and let him be lifted up among us. And then, Lord, as we lift him up, let him draw us all closer to him in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Come lead us, Pastor Tim. I told you earlier this week about how I went bicycling and my legs hurt. My arms kind of hurt right now. <laughs> we probably need to come in two or three times a week and practice that, Larry, so my arms can get in shape. Well, several weeks ago when we started having regularly scheduled services inside, we put out on the church sign, we're open. Sunday at 10.30 and 6, Wednesday at 6.30. And that was... That was really great to be able to put that on the side. Well, it stood there for about six, seven weeks, and I started not noticing it anymore because it was just part of the lawn furniture. And I said to Vicki, I said, let's change that sign. I said, let's put something positive, something enthusiastic out there. Does anybody know what the sign says now? <laughs> Pastor, I think we need to pray. <laughs> It says, Jesus is the joy of living. What a good message for this day and time. We have a lot of people who really aren't living right now. I felt like I wasn't living. I feel like it's still March sometimes because we didn't really do anything for April. We didn't do anything for May or June, July. But we're living because Jesus gives us joy and makes it worth it. You know, Kim Collingsworth great musician, a great pianist. She wrote a song during this quarantine and it was called Joy is Not Cancelled. Easter was cancelled. All the sporting games were cancelled. Lots of summer camps and camp meetings were cancelled. But joy is not cancelled. If he lives within your heart, he provides you joy and he gives you meaning for life. We're going to begin tonight by singing number 369. And in the title is what's on our sign. Jesus is 
is the joy of living. Let's sing it together tonight. I have found the wondrous Savior, Jesus Christ, the soul's delight. Every blessing of His favor fills my heart with hope so bright. Jesus is the joy of living. Cheers. 
probably on Wednesday nights and uh, Pastor Sweezy and I were talking about that and he said you know this rebuilding the church thing might be kind of fun <laughs> he began to share with me some of the some of the talents that Reverend Dan and Lenore have and how uh, they're going to contribute to our church family here and uh, I was really excited and then today uh, we started a brand new Sunday school class for young adults we met up here in what we used to call Hal's room and uh, we had nine young people in there under the age of 40. And I think there's more. It's going to grow. Word is spreading. And so God is working there. And then I don't know if you noticed at the beginning of service today, but Roger and I had to add some additional chairs to the choir because there wasn't going to be enough room up there for the choir. We had 20 up there today, and it looked rather full. And so God is moving there too. Amen. And then we got out of service, and I looked at the attendance board, and it said 129. And I thought, oh, my. That is exciting. And I thought to myself, hmm, this rebuilding the church thing might be kind of fun. <laughs> and then I overheard Sister Kay before service say that they had 16 children in children's church this morning. Praise the Lord. God is doing something. God is walking with us individually, but as a church, 
God has not forsaken us. Our numbers might be lower than they used to be. We might not be having as many people as we did before. But I'm convinced that God is still working. And he walks with us every step of the way. You might call this a valley. He's with us all the way along. It is Jesus. Let's sing about it tonight. Oh, no. 
battle's over, we shall wear a crown. I looked for it in our hymnal and it wasn't there. I had to look up some Baptist hymnal to find it. But that's all right. I think it's still a good song. Let's sing this chorus tonight. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Wear a crown, wear a crown, wear a bright and shining crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Shouting when the saints come marching home in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, waving palms with loud hosannas as the King shall take his throne in the new Jerusalem. Yes, they'll be singing, they'll be shouting when the saints come marching home in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. time this evening. And Brother Cook, I wonder if you would lead us from where you are tonight. There's always requests for us to remember. And so as a corporate body tonight, let's lift up our entire church family. Let's pray for the leadership of our church. Let's pray for one another. And let's stand together as Brother Cook leads us. Well, we're glad for the hope that we have beyond this life. All because the Savior who died that we might have eternal life. Yes. And Lord, we come to you tonight just as humble as we know how, for we're needy people. Oh God, we need revival to sweep our country, to sweep our church, and to sweep our souls. Yes, Lord. Yeah. And so we pray, Lord, that you come in a very special way, oh God, and help our country tonight, oh God. Oh, for an old place, and Holy Ghost revival that break out. So we say, believers sanctified and backsliders reclaimed. God, our heart longs for that. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you would send that upon us. Remember our leaders today, oh God, we pray you bless them. We ask God you would bless the church. We're glad, Lord, that you're still working, God. The devil's trying his best to shut it down. The greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we lean upon that and we trust upon that. And we know it's true tonight. Oh God, we thank you for this service. Thank you for the songs. We ask, oh God, that you would bless and remain in this service. And those that's not able to be here, Lord, go and speak to them, we pray, and bless their hearts. And we're so glad we're serving a living Savior. Thank you, Jesus. And we're serving risen Saviors in the world today. And we're so glad for that, oh Lord. He lives in our soul. We ask again, Holy Ghost, you bless the word. Bless the speaker tonight, oh God. We love Brother Sweezy. We thank you for his ministry yes, and the work of Tim yes. Good and his yes. wife. Bless him, we pray, oh God. Yes. We need that in our day and age. Yes. Again, Holy Ghost, walk these aisles. Uh, speak to our souls. Yes, sir. Oh God, may this be a very personal life we don't come tonight, oh Lord. May the light like shine upon our hearts Lord more Jesus. than ever before. We're loving us. I thank you, dear Jesus, for what you are to us. For you are our everything. Nothing else, nothing else comes close except the presence of Jesus Christ in the life. And we thank you, man. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless your name forevermore. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Coach. Musicians, let's sing. I am thine, O Lord, in the key of G. It's number 473 if you'd like to use the hymnal. Vicki, let's sing I am thine, O Lord. We're going to break from the stage one. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer to thee. So draw me nearer, nearer. 
Delight of a single hour that before thy throne I stand. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune and spread with bread. Draw me nearer, dear blessed Lord, to the cross. I'm so glad that God saw fit to establish the church upon this rock. He would build the church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Glory to God. Praise his name.
tonight from uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, and uh, you can remain seated. This is going to be kind of a long read. First Kings 19, a story that many of you are very familiar with, and I'm sort of beginning right in the middle of the story, because I'm beginning right in the middle of verse 9. Uh, maybe it'd be better to go ahead and read the entire chapter. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. How he had killed the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And at once the angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by the food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave, and he spent the night. Now the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there came an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Then Elijah heard it and pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, the king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king of Israel. And anoint Elijah, son of Saphat, from Abel Mahalo, uh, Mahal, Mahalo and su to succeed you as a prophet. And Jehu will put to death any who escape from the sword of Haziel. And Elijah will put to death any who escape from the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouth have not kissed him. Now two verses out of the 46th Psalm, verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord, open our eyes and our minds 
and touch our hearts and help us to understand what it is to be led by you. And Father, we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I think the deepest yearning in the heart of every Christian is to know that they know God's will for their life and that they're following that will. There's a kind of courage that comes along with, a, with an assurance. I know what the will of the Lord is, and I know I'm about that business. There's also a kind of a backstop if you think about it, because while you're about doing the Lord's will, when you start running into difficulties, and trust me, you will, then you can stop at that point and say, you know, Lord, here I am, right where you sent me, now what? <laughs> and it's amazing how often God will come and save you and clear the way and move on through the problem. Sometimes you were sent there because of the problem to sort it out. That's not just about ministers, it's about all Christians. Sometimes you are put in the middle of some troubles to straighten them out. I had a good friend back in Parkersburg, West Virginia, who uh, got a job at a company there in that town. I don't want to mention a company. But after he was working for them for two or three weeks, I was asking him about the job, and he liked the job. He, he kind of liked the boss. He liked working there. He liked what he was doing. But he said, the place is a mess. And I said, what do you mean it's a mess? He said, there are people at that place that are fighting against each other. And uh, I, I don't know how the company's going to survive with, with different people doing different things to defeat one another while they're trying to, to get customers and sell things. They keep undercutting one another and, and uh, backstabbing one another. And he said, it just, just, he said you, you, you wouldn't believe what it's like during break time when we sit down to have lunch and, and the way that they talk to each other. And there's such a, just a, a horrible negative atmosphere. I just, I can't see how that's ever going to work out. And I, I remember at that time, I was a young Christian, but I remember at that time and I said, well, maybe the Lord sent you there to try to straighten some of that out. Sometimes what a place really needs is a Christian witness. I was saying that out of my own experience because I had become a paramedic and I was working at the Cannon Clark Memorial Hospital in the emergency room there. There were a lot of, you know, kind of distracting things going on among the staff in that emergency room. And it was, it was a difficult place and I remember thinking that, well, you know, the Lord's planted me here to be a witness. Um, finally, in the end, some of the crooked things that people were doing was exposed and several of them got fired. But the Lord needed somebody there to, to stand up for what's right and to say what was right. And I kept talking to all the people, all of them who were in the emergency room about their soul. Um, one of those ladies was uh, working very hard to steal uh, a husband away from his wife and she was working very hard at it and I remember every night I had some pretty strong things to say to her and I said to her you know if you are successful you're not going to enjoy what happens next you think you will but you won't and uh, she kept on doing what she was doing and finally he divorced his wife and he married her and uh, then the next year or so that I was working there uh, she was grumbling and complaining about having to deal with his children by his previous wife and what a difficulty and I thought to myself why would you think they'd be delighted that you came along Sometimes that's what we need to do is to be right where the Lord wants us to be, right in the middle of the problem, to be a witness. I didn't know that that lady was a uh, Nazarene pastor's daughter and that he was on the, the, the board and uh, that he was one of the ones who made a decision that I would get a district license based on the fact that I was witnessing to her constantly about what was going on in her life. Um, you know as well as I do, those of you who have jobs, that in some of those work situations, things are really not great. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happen. And it's a funny thing in this world. Um, the way things have arranged themselves in most work sites is that Christians are not allowed to speak. Do you know that? You can get fired for saying what you think. If what you think is Christian thoughts. Now, if your thoughts are devilish, then it's okay. You can say that as much as you want. 
But if, if you inject Jesus into the discussion, you can get fired. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing that I see going on, but it happens all the time. My daughter was at North Central High School. A teacher told her she was going to hell because she ate meat during Ramadan. That same school, about three weeks later, fired a teacher because she happened to mention the name of Jesus during one of her lectures. She got fired. Out of hand. When I went to talk to them about the uh, Islamic guy jumping on my daughter in front of a bunch of students about Ramadan, oh, I couldn't see him. I wasn't allowed to discuss it with him. And, and what happened was they weren't going to discuss it either because that would be, you know, getting involved in his personal religion because, you know, it's okay for an Islamic person to say those things. It's not okay for Christians to say those things. Hmm? What? I mean, we're at a place in this country where certain things that you say can get you in a lot of trouble. Do you know that if you happen to mention you're for what's going on down on the border with the construction of the border wall that you can get fired? You know why? Because you're proving you're a racist. I thought we were proving we were Americans. I thought we were proving that we wanted poor people who had low paying jobs that we didn't want to see those jobs taken away by even poorer people who had no right being here legally. Even saying that would get you fired. We are in a time where those kinds of things are going on and, and, and knowing that we're following God's will, doing what the Lord wants us to do. And sometimes you find yourself in a, in a very desperate situation. You have to be careful about what you say and how you say it. And be on your guard. But Elijah found himself in a situation where he was pretty much locking horns with the queen because she wanted Baal worship all through the country. And she found herself at loggerheads with this prophet. And, and after three and a half years of, of a real desperate drought, he called all the people together, including the king at the mountain, and said, now we'll find out whose God really is God. And you know the story about him setting up two altars and two sacrifices, and the answer being, whichever God call, comes down with fire and, and, and accepts the offering, that's the real God. And so they, they prayed all day. They cut themselves. They did all kinds of things. And the prophet made fun of them. It was kind of... I don't know if you get into the details of the Hebrew of what he's actually saying. He's saying things like, you know, maybe your God is tired and he's taking a nap. And there's another place where he sort of insinuates that your God is busy. He's probably at the, in the toilet. You'll have to wait till he comes out. I mean, that's literally what he's saying in Hebrew. Can you imagine how insulting that was? There's a guy who's looking to get fired. <laughs> then he pours water all over his offering. And the fire comes down and burns up the offering and burns up the, the, the altar that was built for it and goes down into the, the, the ditch that is around the altar where the water has run off and licks up all the water out of the ditch. And then Elijah takes a sword while everybody is stupefied by what's just happened and he kills 400 prophets of Baal. Pretty good day's work if you think about it. And now we begin the story where this weak kneed king goes back and tells his wife, the real boss, what's going on. And boy, she gets mad and lets Elijah know how she feels about it and what's about to happen to him. And she does a pretty thorough job of scaring him, so he decides to run. Sometimes when we're in trouble, it's the easiest thing in the world to run. It's a natural kind of thing. It's a reaction within us. Uh, it's the, what they call it, flee or fight syndrome. That, that when we feel threatened, we either put up a defense or we start beating feet the other direction, try to make some room between us and whatever is scaring us. And so he runs away. And finds himself down in the desert. How do we know what God's will is when things are in such tumult? When we just can't 
hardly stop long enough to get our breath and all these things are happening. I, I read that story and then I read this part of the Psalms and, and there's a few things that occurred to me and I just want to take a few minutes tonight and share them with you. It's Some of it's from my own experience, but most of it's from the scripture. How do you know the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the devil? Because the devil's such a good actor, you know, at being the angel of light. And he tricks a lot of people. Sometimes he tricks them because he's very tricky and they're not paying close enough attention. And sometimes he tricks them because, you know, they're just not very smart. What should we do? How do we find out what God's will is? I remember I was um, up for a vote as a pastor at a church and a lady voted no and she came to me after the service and she said, I prayed and prayed for direction, couldn't get any, so I voted no. Did I do the right thing? <laughs> that was the day that it occurred to me that sometimes there are stupid people in your church and you can't, it doesn't matter how much teaching you do, you can't fix stupid. It's forever. And the only thing you can do is just have pity and love them, you know, and, and try to guide them as best you can as a Christian. But the truth is, you can't educate that kind of foolishness out of people. I mean, it's just the way they are. It's a wonder a lot of pastors don't just, you know, throw their license in the trash and go find a real job. You know what I mean? You understand what I mean by a real job, you pastors out there? If I wanted to work in an insane asylum, I could have got a lot more money working in an insane asylum than working here. <laughs> well, people aren't insane. Sometimes they're just a little, you know, dull. Maybe they just didn't get enough orange juice when they were young. I don't know. But how do we figure out what God's will is for our life? How do you know that the direction you're following is the Holy Spirit and not the devil tricking you? And, and I wanted to share some things, I think, out of my own experiences and a little bit out of the prophet's experiences that might help you. The Holy Spirit carries with him an atmosphere. Yes. You know when you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Did you, did you pick that up this morning? Yeah. I don't think they sang four bars of that song before everybody felt that. Did you feel that this morning? Yes. He carries an atmosphere of quietness. What I mean by that is that all the noise in your soul settles down. In a, in a period of time in our country where uh, music is extremely loud and f frenetic, I mean wild, uh, your mind can't stay up with all of it. I remember one guy pulled up beside me at the stoplight, was downtown in Indianapolis, pulled up beside me at the stoplight, and he, he had on one of those uh, rap groups, and they were just yelling and screaming, you know, like they do, and the music was just pounding, pounding away, and he had that big uh, jukebox bass in the trunk of his car, just vibrating the windows of his car, and vibrating the windows of my car, and vibrating the fillings in my teeth, and I was listening to, <laughs> and it was a really filthy, filthy lyrics. And the guy looked over at me and he saw I wasn't enjoying it. He turned it down. He said, what's the matter? Don't you like my music? And I remembered back to my days of Dick Clark. Now, some of you may not know who that guy was. But I, remember, I said, it's boring. It's repetitive. And I hate to think that that guy kisses his mom with that mouth. <laughs> you know, considering what was coming out of it. I mean, I said that to him. Of course, he was too young to know who Dick Clark was, so I didn't tell him when they point me, trying to inform me. There's, it's just noise. And in that noise of everybody and everything going on around you, it's real difficult. But when the Holy Spirit comes, there's a kind of a quietness. And it doesn't matter whether there's a hurricane going on around you or not. It just all goes away for a little while because that's all outside and inside there's peace. And a kind of a calm assurance. But the devil, by comparison, carries with him an atmosphere that's negatively charged. Negative ideas and confusion that blocks out any sense of clarity at all. Everything becomes unclear. 
You know, things that are simple, easy to understand, for you they become unclear. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Well, yeah, you are confused. And he doesn't grant you any let up or delay. We'll take a little time and think about this. No, 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 no. We've got to do it now. We've got to make some, we've got to make a decision right now. Now, now's the time to do it. Let me tell you something. That's the worst time to do it. He wants to stampede us into taking some kind of an act. And he wants us to do it now. And he usually threatens you with something that you're afraid of anyway, like, you know, getting killed. And so what does Elijah do? He just gets up and starts running. Poof, you know, he's gone. And he runs a long way. And he realizes his servant is with him and he says, you know, you stop here and I'm going to go a little farther. That's what he thought. When you read this story, does it ever occur to you, okay, the angel gave him something to drink and something to eat twice and he, and he recovered physically and then he went on his journey. But it says he went on his journey for 40 days into the wilderness. Where did he find food and water while he was going out there after three and a half years of drought? They just leave that out of the story. I'm left to assume the same God who sent the angel to feed him and give him something to drink was looking out for him all the way along the trip, but it's just not in there. Am I supposed to assume that those two pieces of bread and those two jars of water was enough to carry him for 40 days? Doesn't seem logical. But I know enough about God to know that if he tells you to start walking, he's going to look out for you the whole way you're walking. Somebody's going to come up and help you out. He knew what that was like. He hid out in Cherith and, and the birds came and fed him. And, and he drank from the, the beautiful, what a beautiful place. To, where are you? I live in Cherith. Doesn't that even sound, wouldn't you like to live in, you know, 477 Cherith Street? It just sounds <laughs> nice, doesn't it? Then the brook dries up and the birds stop coming and God says, I want you to go over to this town and there's a widow lady over there and she's kind of got a negative attitude and I want you to visit her. That, why, why did he send him to a woman with such a horrible negative attitude? I'm going to eat this little piece of bread, my son and I, and we're going to die. <laughs> Don't you just want to go to church with her? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was because she needed him to show up. There was a problem and God sent him into the middle of it. Because it wasn't about him, it was about what God wanted. I got a, I got a message for you. It's always about what God wants. Amen. It's never about what you want. Hello? Yes. But believe me, it turns out to be much better than what you want. A lot better. You see, God demands no action if his will is not clear. If we're a little bit confused, he'll keep talking to us until it clears up. It's not because he's not making himself clear. It's just that we're a little hard on the receiving end. And sometimes he has to speak to us two or three times before we really get it. Now, I'm not... Proposing that is the proper way to deal with God. What I'm saying is that's what really happens with a lot of people where the rubber meets the road. Sometimes God has to talk to them several times before they, they really are clear. Okay, I get it. And he doesn't ask us to follow when his voice is a little bit uncertain. It makes it clear. What did Jesus say? My sheep know my voice. There's something about, I don't know, the tone. Or the way he says it. Martha's in the garden. She's heartbroken. Have you taken him away? Can you tell me what you've done with his body? And he just says her name. And there's something about that. The being on the road to Emmaus are walking home and and they're de dejected and he's trying to teach them the scriptures and they're listening while he's teaching them the scriptures. But it's when he breaks the bread and gives the usual Jewish blessing over the bread that suddenly something in the tone of his voice woke them up to who they were with. And we get a sense that, okay, I'm certain now that that's the Lord's will. Sometimes clouds come. Sometimes evil thoughts come. Sometimes the storms come and we're tested and our faith is tested. And our willingness to, 
to, to wait and to have confidence is pressed because of the storm. We don't really want to, to, to wait on the Lord. We want the Lord to hurry up, do something. And in this turbulent time, Elijah the prophet fell prey to that hurry up and, and do something, and he just took off running. I want you to notice something about this story that just struck me like somebody hit me with a board when I was reading it this time. There are two times inside this story where God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? Did you read that? That ought to be the title of a sermon sometime. You can take that down south if you want. And now if you're listening to this message, you can use it too. The rest of you guys leave it alone. <laughs> I mean, what are you doing here? Twice he says to it. I mean, that might have been a clue that he wasn't really where he needed to be. What are you doing here? I didn't send you here. He ran until he was tired. And then when he was tired, he became depressed. And when he became depressed, he wanted to die. And he begged to die. And God fed him. And God gave him something to drink. And God let him sleep. And God renewed him. And isn't there a clue for dealing with depression there? That sometimes what you need to do is lay down and take a nap. And get up and eat something decent. And lay down and take another nap. That sometimes what we have to do is to jump out of the high, high speed fast lane that we're living in. And get over where there's no traffic. And just calm ourselves down a little bit. Depression lives where, where things are going at a terrific rate. And then we come to these verses. Be still and know that I am God. You know, I really need to say this to you. God's always got something for you to do. I have become convinced that retirement for me is when they tighten down the bolts on my box. And I, I'm not trying to be funny. I've just become convinced of that. I think I'm in it for the whole game. Not for a portion of it. I, I cannot in my own mind, and my wife knows this is true, I cannot in my own mind, we talk about it sometimes, I can't in my mind hold on to the possibility of any kind of retirement. When I leave this church, guess what? <laughs> I'll go somewhere else to be pastor. And if I can't find a district superintendent who let me be a pastor of some church on his district, that's all right. I know what to do. Start one. <laughs> I just heard from a pastor in West Virginia, and he, or DS in West Virginia, and he said, they don't have any applications from pastors at all. And so when churches become available in that state, they are struggling to find pastors to come and pastor the churches in the state of West Virginia, at least the northern half of West Virginia. I don't know about the southern half. You don't want to go down there. It's coal mine country. Lord, preserve you from being a pastor to coal miners. I'll explain that to you if you want to know the, later on. I mean, we really need to understand that we, we have to slow down and let God speak to us. And what does he say to him? Well, okay. I want you to go and anoint this person to be king. I want you to go up there and anoint that person to be king. And I want you to anoint this person to be the prophet in your place. He still had big job for him to do. And he's wanting to die in the desert. No, 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 that's not my plan. I got another plan for you. And you know what the best part of it was? He just wouldn't let him die. He took him to heaven. In a chariot of fire. That's never happened before. There's only two people in the Bible that I know of that that happened with. But he was one of them. That, that it, doesn't, it isn't recorded anywhere that he died or that his body was anywhere. The Lord just took him. They looked for him thoroughly, but they didn't find him because, you know, he was gone. He wanted to die. No, it's not time yet. You know what that means? God's got something else for him to do. 
And I think we need to understand that, that God has his plan for our life. He has a, a, something for us to do. And we always need to be looking, okay, now this is the situation. What is it you want me to do? And I didn't like being drafted. I didn't like being in the army. But when I settled down, I, I thought to myself, okay, I'm here. Now what? I was in an infantry unit. Oh, great. Ground pounders. Bush beaters. Oh, man. Got this idiot stick out there beating the bushes and trying to find the enemy. What a job. And then I got sick and I had my kidney taken out. And I thought, Lord. They said, well, you know, you're not much good to us in the infantry anymore because... You know, you've had this kidney taken out, but we have to appoint somebody to work at that MASH hospital. We'll send you. You'll be the guy filling our space up there. So I got a job working in a, in a MASH hospital. Okay, that's what I did. The rest of the time I was in the Army, I worked at that MASH hospital. But I ran into a group of Christians up there. The pharmacist and two of the doctors and, and uh, the guy in charge of x-ray and there were several other uh, just regular medics who were Christians too. And we began to meet together regularly and pray. We finally opened a coffee house ministry and started running in at nights. And a lot of pretty lonely GIs would come wandering in and we got to talk to them about the Lord. We had a great time of personal evangelism. We were winning a two new people to the Lord almost every night. Imagine that. Boy, wouldn't a DS be proud of a church like they could report that? I had 32 new believers in my new believers class, and I was just one of five teachers in that group. And all of them joined the Frankfurt Church of the Nazarene in Germany. <laughs> I was proud of that class. Uh, God opened doors and, and gave me opportunities to preach in the chapel services and in other places around and, and to hold revival services. And, there, there were things for us to do. There, there were always things for us to do. And one of the things that, that, that becoming a young preacher in that mold was that I wasn't taught in the usual mold. So when I came home and people told me I needed to fit a mold, I just thought to myself, no, I'm sorry. I don't think that's the way you go about it. It's about the kingdom. It's about building the kingdom. And when you see an opportunity, you seize it. And there's some people just can't, oh, no, we got to do it this way. We have to do it. We've always done it that way. We've always done it. I just, you know... Yeah, and how's that working out for you? Yes. I just wanted to laugh. I heard somebody say this week, you know, the president's an evil man because when the, the COVID broke out, he didn't tell us all the truth about it. He was trying to keep us calm about what was going on. And they said, well, he was lying and deceiving us. I wanted to say to the person, we have an old saying, uh, goes a long way back in West Virginia that when you're hanging on to the side of a cliff by your fingernails don't start waving your arms I mean that's a dumb I mean anybody ought to know that and, and, they, and there's a lot of people in the church that they don't get the basic common sense kinds of truths like that do you know how to build a church do you know how to build a church you have to pray Hello? You have to call. You have to witness to people and preach the gospel. Amen. Now, all the rest of it is just window dressing. Now, I know everybody's got great ideas. Well, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to, woohoo, we're going to jazz the church up. We're going to be, you know, whatever. We're going to play rock and roll music and everybody's going to get saved. Yeah, try that. What we need to do is is to get quiet and let God speak to us. Amen. We don't need to be running clear down to Mount Horeb in the desert 40 days away. We, we don't need to be running away from people because they say boo to us. Do you know how many times in my ministerial life, and I've been a pastor now for, was it 42 years? Almost 43? Do you know how many times in my ministerial life I've been told I'd finished? Do you know? I don't know. I lost count. You know what I learned to say to people? You didn't call me. God did. 
And when he says, I'm finished, I'm finished. But you're not God. Stop trying to act like you are. You're not. I mean, there, there, there are ministers here in this room. You know, as, as sure as I'm standing on this platform, that you've heard those very conversations aimed at you, haven't you? You're finished. You're finished. You're finished. I just want to say to them, and if we can all get together and maybe form a choir and get in tune and just and just look them all right in the face and go, <laughs> oh my goodness, that's on TV. <laughs> oh, I'm finished now. You're finished now. Yeah, I've heard it before. <laughs> We've got to settle down and let God tell us what he wants us to do. And we need to do that. Instead of everybody, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You got you to do something. No, I don't. Well, I'm 10 minutes over. But I'm going to finish one part of the message I intended to share with you. When I got out of the army, I worked for a while with my brother as a plumber. And that wasn't a good thing. I mean, I, I made some money doing that. But uh, then I got a job working for a computer firm, and, and I started moving up through that company. And, and then the, the youth pastor at our church resigned, and we needed a youth pastor. So I quit the job at the computer firm and went to school full-time at West Virginia University and worked part-time as the youth pastor of that church for a year. So I guess that's 43 years. One of the classes I took at West Virginia University was just enough to fit a hole in my schedule. It was an EMT class. You know, I needed those hours. It wasn't exactly fit into, but I just needed. So I took the class. You know, I'd been a, a medic in the Army for three years. So I figured I might have a leg up on that. And what do you know? I got an A. <laughs> you know, everything the Army does doesn't stink. Some of it's okay. I didn't learn that in the medical training center at Fort Sam, but I learned an awful lot at that MASH hospital. You know, rubber beats the road kind of stuff. You do learn medical things. And, and those doctors were always real keen to train us medics. And I was keen to hear what they had to say because it meant life or death for some people out there. And so I passed the class. It's good. And then came that Carter recession. Any of you remember that? Double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, and uh, double-digit uh, interest rates. It was, a, it was a financial miracle. It's never happened before. It, but in a negative sense, and, and uh, jobs were awful hard to find. And they, they ran an ad that said they were going to start a, an ambulance service at the city hospital in our town, Camden Clark. And so I, I turned in an application. A lot of people did. And I had my EMT license because that was part of that class I took at West Virginia University. Brand new. And I turned that in and... They hired me, or they called me in, and they said, we want to hire you, but we're a little afraid of you because, you know, I'm scary. <laughs> I said, afraid of me? What do you mean afraid of me? And they said, well, you know too much. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody talk to you that way? What a way not to hire someone. Well, you know too much. Well, I'm sorry. I try to be, you know, more like you. <laughs> HR department, <laughs> horribly ridiculous. And so I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know how to do things that you're not legally allowed to do in civilian life. I said, yeah, they taught me how to do things. Like for instance, you know how if somebody's inhaled a lot of smoke and burn their throat and stuff and they can't breathe, you know how to do a cricothyroidotomy. And I said, yeah, I know how to do that. Don't want to, but I know how. And you've delivered babies. I definitely didn't want to do that, but yeah. I know how to do that. Not again. You know. You, you start IVs and you, you know, they were going on. You did, you know, small surgeries. Yeah, I did. I, you stitched, yeah, I stitched a lot of people up. I was a regular stitch man at that hospital. I, I sewed up more people than the doctors. They, they all admitted that. He's, he knows more about this than we do because he does it all the time. I said, 
Just give me a list of what you don't want me to do and I won't do it. I need a job. And they hired me. And when I left there to go to Mount Vernon, Nazarene University, they said, we'll keep you on. And anytime you're free from school, we'll let you work shifts here at the, at the hospital. Do you know that between the money I got from the, from the army and the money that I got from the, from the hospital, I left college debt free. Now I had to eat an awful lot of Denny Moore stew, but I got through there. <laughs> And I don't ever want to see a thumbprint on a can again in my life. I mean, really, don't want any more Denny Moore stew. I just don't. I, you know, I, I sort of don't like beef stew of any kind now because of that. Really, it sort of ruined me on it. I was following God's will for my life. And I went through that all those experiences and the Lord taught me a lot of things. And you know what? When I got over to, to become a missionary, I mean, literally everything I had done in my life up until then helped me. I had worked as a roustabout two summers. That helped a lot in putting up tents and stuff around Papua New Guinea. I had been a, a medic in the army and I had become a paramedic working for that hospital. And sometimes it helped with people who were sick or sometimes I was out in places where they were too far away from a doctor and I was the nearest thing to it. And I, I treated a lot of people. I didn't have any kind of medical license or anything, but I carried a kit with me and, and I took care of a lot of people's injuries and wounds. People would come to, the, to my house at night and, 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 and I would see them. And if the nurse wasn't there, I would take care of them. There were just a lot of things like that that, that fit into that job of being principal over a college. Not exactly what they expect you to do here in American schools. But, but when you just follow the will of the Lord, when you, when you just settle yourself down and follow the will of the Lord, He opens doors. He will take... I don't know where He got bread and water for that 40-day trip, but I know He got it. God supplied all of His needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I believe that happened out there in the desert. Because I've seen what he's done for me for 42 years. And I'm not starving. You think I am? Time to change those glasses. We need to have confidence that when we know, finally have that peace that comes with the will of God. You know, the will of God is one of the first things I've noticed about the will of God is it brings with it peace. There's an aha moment where you just say to yourself, yep, that's it. And if you're not getting that, you need to keep your foot on the brake. Don't be hurried into making a decision. Because it can be a disaster. But if you just be still and wait on the Lord, He'll reward you. And you'll sure love the reward. Father, we bow our heads before you now. We praise you and we thank you and we glorify you for what you do for us and giving us direction in our life. And we pray that you'll continue to help us to have peace, to wait on your clear direction, even in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know what to do. I think I'm keeping my foot on the brake. Can I have a few men come and pray? I know what it is to say yes to you. And I know what it is that when you say, this is the way. There's power and confidence that comes with that. And for the people in this room who are being challenged by the devil with false direction and a screaming voice yelling, hurry up, bring peace, bring clarity, and bring that still small voice that sounds like a whisper 
but as so much more clearly your voice than all the other noisy things that happen around us. And help us to know that whisper and to feel the, the power of it and the truth of it and the peace and the calm that it brings. How sweet it is. And Lord, we glorify you and praise you because you do that for us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're going to continue to pray. God blessing on you. We'll see you Wednesday night. Thank you.